So welcome everyone to our uh, webinar series. Uh, we hope you will find it interesting. Um, I'm Margaret Brodkin. I will be the semi-moderator, although a moderator is not really needed so much in this webinar. Uh, I am the founder and director of Funding the Next Generation, which is sponsoring this. And um, Funding the Next Generation is five years old, and it was started uh, because we wanted to see people all over the state, coalitions and cities and counties throughout the state, be able to do some of the things that actually I was able to take a leadership role in doing in San Francisco, um, specifically to help people create dedicated funding for kids. So we hope we inspire people to do that and we sponsor all kinds of learning opportunities to make that possible. So today, um, the topic is how is the pandemic impacting this work and impacting people's opinions about revenue for kids, about revenue general, generally, what makes sense in terms of the future, in terms of um, local ballot measures for kids in what we say a post-COVID-19 world, actually a current COVID-19 world. and. Um, Oh dear me. So how do I do next? Why can't I figure that out? Somebody want to help me? The next slide. There it is. Yay. So we have two wonderful speakers, two of the most wonderful people in the world that I have had the enormous pleasure of being able to work with and who have devoted enormous time and energy and talent to this effort of funding the next generation. And many of you people people, many of the people on the call actually know these people, but first we'll hear from Dave Metz, who is the president and a principal of FM3. He's one of the M's in FM3, which is one of the nation's leading uh, opinion research uh, firms. And Dave has been there since uh, 1998. And he works on all kinds of issues. He's worked in 50 states. He's worked with mayors. With He's worked on campaigns at all levels of government. Um, and he has a particular expertise in the environment and in climate change. But the thing we love him for is that he has also <laughs> made an expertise of children. And, Particularly, he's done funding all over the state with people we've worked with and some around the country um, on are people ready to make funding children a priority? And he has helped, you know, people really analyze that. And that's what he's here to talk about today. So I'm just thrilled that he is doing this. Um, I am thrilled that we can work with somebody who is so outstanding and so well known. And the other person who is going to be here is an equally fabulous person, Nicole Durst, who I got to know when she was the staff person to the Youth Commission in San Francisco and was all about empowering young people. She then went to work for Obama and became uh, the national training director for the Organizing for America, which was Obama's uh, organizing effort in uh, 2012. I think she came back here and started uh, 50 plus one strategies with her co-director and founder, Adisu Demisi. And I guess it's not a secret since I read it in the paper that Adisu has been uh, chosen by uh, Biden to actually run the Democratic Convention. So if you want to have some input, I bet Nicole could get uh, a message <laughs> to him. So uh, we have two fabulous people here. Nicole has become a star of the uh, California uh, political um, consultants, and we are just thrilled that she has devoted so much energy and time to helping us and training people through this initiative. So I'm going to stop sharing now, Dave, so you can start sharing and take off your mute. <laughs> and uh, okay, thank you. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you, Margaret. I, I 
I think I'm going to have to take a clip of this recording and just sort of let you introduce me wherever I speak. You're always so gracious and uh, uh, kind in, in how you frame the work we've done. Um, so it's good to see everybody today, at least virtually. Um, what I've put together is a compilation of what we have learned over the last couple of weeks about um, doing opinion research, assessing where the public's sort of mood and issue priorities are in this very challenging time, um, and taking a look at both uh, what we can glean about their attitudes toward investment in youth and how all of the changes of the last couple of months might affect both the viability of funding measures in November and also the most effective ways to frame and present them to voters uh, to try to maximize support. Um, I do wanna stress that everything that I'm gonna share with you today uh, is a snapshot of this moment in time. Pollsters always say that, right? Any, any given poll is just a picture of where uh, voters are on the days that you're talking to them. Uh, but it is more important than ever to remember that in this current environment. Uh, things are changing rapidly from a public health perspective, uh, from a, a social and economic justice perspective, um, and certainly from a perspective of people's uh, financial and, and household well-being. And the one thing we can be absolutely certain of is that a lot is going to change between now and November. Um, at the same time, we're far enough into the impacts of the pandemic that I think voters are able to look forward and, and make some reasonable estimates about where they're going to be in November and provide us with answers to questions that reflect um, the challenges that, that we're collectively facing right now. So um, hopefully there's some learnings here which can start you thinking about um, what might need to be done in November. And, and I do want to just say right now, this is something that you know I, Margaret and I go back and forth on, um, I don't think, uh, despite everything that's happened, that there is reason to be unduly pessimistic about our opportunities in November. Uh, all of the data that we have collected since the start of the pandemic, when we're testing local ballot measures, not necessarily for youth explicitly, but for the wide array of things that local government in California wants to fund, um, we are continuing to see high levels of support. And in those cases where we have direct comparisons between where support is today and where it was pre-pandemic, in most communities, it's held up pretty well. Um, and what that means, given what is still anticipated to be overwhelmingly large turnout in November, and turnout that ought to be very uh, friendly towards support for kids, um, I think gives us reason to believe that um, we still have some opportunities here. We say that with humility and caution, given everything that's going on, but um, but overall, the data is encouraging. So uh, let's sort of dive into what we've been learning. Um, and first, let me just, I, I sort of want to address the first question we inevitably get asked when we have these discussions, which is, can you even do polling right now? How is it possible that you can call people and talk to them, given all of the stresses and anxieties that they're feeling? And, and you know, are they even willing to, to tell you what they think? Um, and the answer is yes. In fact, this is the best environment for doing opinion research that we have seen in years. Um, the, from a logistical perspective, we've made adjustments to sort of deal with the things that pollsters need to do to, to do their work. Um, our call centers have come up with ways of spacing uh, people who are doing the calling out, cleaning equipment, providing workers with software, which enables them to make calls from home, um, all of which has allowed us to continue doing research. And sort of a very, very tiny silver lining of, of the challenges we faced here is that people are willing to talk to us, much more willing than they have been in, in recent years. Uh, in some cases, we've seen as much as a 25% improvement in response rates um, because people are at home and they have time on their hands and they have strong opinions about what's going on. And when you're doing, asking them questions about things that are relevant to their current lives and the challenges we're all facing, um, they want to talk. And so uh, it's been very encouraging to uh, see the kind of data that we've been getting back um, and, and the degree to which the public is willing to participate. And we really haven't seen any evidence at all of people having a negative reaction, saying, why are you calling me? This is an intrusion or anything like that. Um, so that's all good news. And it means that if anything, the numbers I'm about to share with you come from surveys where we're getting a more robust, diverse, and representative sample than might have been the case uh, in prior years. So what are we seeing in terms of the public mood? Um, uh, one of the 
initially most surprising findings, but it has been so consistent over the course of the last few weeks, is that there's been this sort of rallying of, of public positive feeling about how things are going both locally and at the statewide level. Uh, the first question in most polls that political and policy pollsters do is to ask people if they think things in their state are headed in the right direction or off on the wrong track. And those numbers had been trending downward uh, in California statewide and in most of the major metropolitan areas of the state over the last couple of years. But as you'll see here, they have bounced back in a big way. In surveys uh, in the last month, we now have a majority of Californians who think things are headed in the right direction. And what seems to be driving that is a feeling of solidarity, that we're kind of all facing a challenge together. Um, our communities have rallied. People are, are uh, taking the stay at home uh, directive seriously and doing their parts to fight the pandemic and to try to help one another through the economic challenges we're facing. Um, that sentiment, if it lasts, and, and granted, it may wear down over time, is obviously helpful when we're talking about trying to motivate people for, for public investments in kids in ways that are going to benefit uh, their community as a whole. We've also seen increasingly positive ratings for a lot of public officials. You'll see here the ratings for the governor are up dramatically, for the state legislature modestly. Uh, the president's ratings haven't moved, as has been the case around the country. Um, but it's really those two items that you'll see toward the bottom of the slide, your city's mayor, your local K-12 school district. In most places where we have benchmark data, those numbers have gotten more favorable. And what it means is people think that uh, local elected leaders have been taking the pandemic seriously, doing a good job of communicating with the public, and uh, trying to make them uh, you know, uh, aware of what they need to do in order to stay safe. Um, and voters seem to appreciate that. And so they're, they're having a more positive feeling toward uh, their local elected representatives. And again, if we're trying to get more resources for government to help kids, that sentiment is one that's positive for us. Um, here you'll see some other numbers. Uh, this is again from statewide survey research showing the degree to which people approve or disapprove of various actors handling of the pandemic. What stands out here is that both state and local government in California, we've got more than 70% who are approving of uh, the job that they're doing. So what are the issues that are concerning Californians right now? Um, this is a, some statewide data where we ask people to rate their concern about a variety of issues facing the state as either extremely, very, somewhat, or not too serious. Um, the dark orange bars on the left are the proportion that rate each extremely serious, expressing some intense concern. And then the purple bars over on the right-hand side are the proportion saying they don't view them as a serious problem at all. So there's a couple of things to glean from this. Number one is concern about the virus and its impacts has leapt to the top of the list. Um, and in particular, and this is over time, we've seen this gap increasing, the economic impacts of the virus are a bigger concern than the public health impacts. Uh, part of the reason for that is that while the concern about the economic impacts is totally bipartisan, concern about the health impacts has become deeply partisan, with Democrats being highly concerned and Republicans largely dismissing. Um, but the other thing to note here is that as these issues have risen to the top of the list, it has not displaced the other things that have been concerns for Californians. Cost of health care, cost of housing, risk of wildfires, these are all still issues that even in the midst of the pandemic, we've got more than 70% of voters rating as extremely or very serious problems. Um, and that means that they still see it as worthwhile to make investments to address these issues. And that will include issues that affect kids. Um, just because we're dealing with all these other challenges doesn't mean that the, the things we were facing before have gone away. And so uh, voters still know that they need to be addressed. Um, and this slide sort of illustrates that. You know, the one issue on this list where we saw a huge change from year to year uh, was concern about unemployment, which obviously has skyrocketed as the unemployment rate has. But most of the other issues are within a couple of percentage points of where they were in a survey that we did at roughly the same time last year. Um, looking forward, we also see that the public is starting to believe that we've turned a corner. Uh, this is data from two surveys we've done over the course of the last couple of months. In April, by almost a two to one margin, voters said they thought the worst is yet to come rather than the worst being over. By May, those numbers had almost equalized. We now have 
roughly equal numbers saying the worst uh, is yet to come and, and that the worst is over. So there's a growing number who think we may have, have turned something of a corner here. Um, but that doesn't mean that from an economic perspective, they don't still have significant concerns. 33% of Californians describe themselves as being uneasy about being able to meet their living expenses in the months ahead. And obviously when we're talking about raising taxes, that concern may be uh, a significant uh, factor that, that uh, uh, potentially limits our ability to raise taxes. Uh, right now, it's not a majority who feel that way, but that's a number to really watch over time and see how much it rises. Um, you'll see here there's only fairly modest variations in, in that sentiment among different subgroups of the electorate, but I will note it is significantly uh, more prevalent among communities of color, in particular African Americans. Um, are feeling more economic anxiety. And then while it isn't on this slide, lower income households uh, much, much more likely, not surprisingly, um, to have that uneasiness. At the same time, the health concerns are not as prevalent. Less than half of voters say they're very concerned about getting sick uh, or someone in their household getting sick and only 15% rate themselves as extremely concerned. Um, and as you'll see on the right hand side, it tends hey. to be would you yeah. mind if I interrupt you for a minute since sure. we're getting questions about the sample and your previous slide went very quickly. People are asking, you know, how does this, how is this influenced by geography, by race, by, um, uh, yeah, uh, and what is the sample size? So um, that last slide really got to that. Are you going to do more slides that break it down by race and geography or should we? go back to that last slide so people can look at it or sure um so so this slide does show some of those distinctions by different oh, subgroups um as does this one um and i've and i've verbally noted some of the places where we've seen big differences by demographics um on most of the questions that i'm sharing the differences the biggest differences we see are along lines of partisanship um ethnicity and income and to some extent geography, given that the pandemic has hit LA County harder than other regions of the state, we see higher levels of concern there. Mo this data comes from a variety of surveys, so it's different timings and sample sizes, but most of this is statewide data. Um, surveys of, I think, between 800 and 1,200 likely 2020 voters statewide. Um, and as we move on, we'll be looking at uh, sort of summaries of, of what we've seen in some local polling. This is all sort of big picture context setting, and we'll We'll uh, drill down a little bit in just a moment. Um, and then finally, you know, when we ask people to look ahead and think um, what time horizon it's going to take for things to be under control for the virus itself, um, most of them think it will happen within the next six months. Uh, they're even more confident if we talk about the next 12 months. When we ask about the economy though, and in what period of time they think the economy will have recovered, there there is much more ambivalence. Uh, only one third of Californians think the economy will recover in the next six months, and obviously that's a time period that takes us to the election in November, um, and less than half think it will recover within a calendar year. Um, so there's a lot more pessimism about the timetable for economic recovery than for the public health situation to be under control. All right, so in this context, what do we know about investing in kids specifically? And the short answer is not a ton within California. Um, you know, I, I caucused all my colleagues and, and partners within the firm. We've done, you know, 100 surveys in different communities in California over the course of the, uh, the last uh, couple months. Um, relatively few of those have focused narrowly on investment in kids. We do have some research that's going to be coming up shortly. Um, here in the Bay Area that I think will, will give us some very detailed answers on this question. But we have done a lot for K through 12 school districts. And what we have seen there is generally strong support for investment in education, uh, both in terms of facilities and then providing money to um, uh, help schools with operating expenses. There's a widespread recognition that school budgets are going to be devastated as a result of the, um, the economic slowdown. Um, and there is also a desire, especially among parents, for schools to reopen and to do what it takes to make it possible for in-person learning in whatever way it needs to be modified uh, to happen again in the fall. Um, we did, however, do a national poll at the very beginning of the pandemic. Now, this was for an organization that's interested in water infrastructure, so a totally different subject. But we wanted, on their behalf, to understand how 
uh, water infrastructure uh, sort of fit in with a variety of other priorities for the federal government to invest in. Um, and one of the items I put on the list was expanding the availability of high quality early childhood education. So we're testing this here with Americans as a national priority. And this poll was done in mid-March. We got out of the field on March 20th, I think. So this was, we were in the field during the first week of widespread stay at home orders after the stock market had gone through two significant crashes and when the virus was on the front page. Um, and you'll see the top rated item as a national priority here was strengthening the economy, which had been at the very bottom of the list of national concerns in prior years polling. So it shows that voters were already in this sort of pandemic and, and economic downturn mindset. And you'll see here the availability of high quality early childhood education is at 72% rating it a very important priority, more than a third of voters rating it as extremely important putting it on a parallel with things like the economy, infrastructure, and opioids, and trailing only uh, improving the healthcare system, which has been nationally the, the top polling concern. This is the top half of the list. Um, ECE stands out as a higher priority than everything you see on this slide. Climate change, trade agreement with China, immigration, national defense, and even an increase in the minimum wage. Um, so that's a pretty potent testimony to the degree to which people believe that investment in early childhood is important. And it is largely, although not totally, bipartisan. Um, Democrats and independents are more likely to rate it a very important priority than our Republicans, but we have solid majorities across party lines that are saying, yes, this is something the federal government should invest in. Um, and these next couple slides I'll go through quickly, but they just show how a variety of other demographics uh, rate this issue. I'm looking at it along ideological lines, very similar to the partisan divides. Those dark purple bars on the left on these slides are the proportion that rate this an extremely important investment priority. So it shows some intensity of feeling. And again, these are numbers that were gathered during a time when the pandemic and its economic impacts were already on voters' minds. In big cities, um, hugely important priority. 50% of voters rating it extremely important. Uh, the intensity goes down as we move toward less populated areas, but even in rural areas, 66% rate it a very important priority. Uh, parents obviously uh, see it as a higher priority than non-parents, but among both groups overall, 70% uh, rating it very important. Extremely strong numbers among African Americans nationally. Almost three in five rate it as an extremely important priority, almost nine in 10 as a very important priority and communities of color in general uh, see it as notably more urgent than do white voters. And there also are some modest differences by age with the youngest voters, those under 30, assigning the highest priority to it, but even among the oldest voters uh, who are unlikely to have uh, kids within that age range at home, but may well have grandkids, uh, still 71% rated is very important. So all of this is good news. You know, that is one data point which tells us that um, even in this environment, voters see investment is in kids as, as being among the most uh, urgent priorities, even at the national level. So all of this is good news, um, but those of you who, uh, you know, have been uh, part of the continuing conversations we've had over the last few months are also looking back at March um, when the news was not good. Um, and frankly, uh, our ability to have some conversations about this, I think, was limited by the fact that we had the primary election here in California on March 5th and uh, then immediately went into um, the, the pandemic and that sort of turned the page politically a little bit. But certainly for those of us that are interested in passing revenue measures, the results in March have to give us pause. Um, of the two measures that were directed toward youth funding in that election, uh, the measure in Alameda County passed with almost two thirds of the vote, but fell short of it. And obviously there's a, uh, ongoing legal discussion about whether that's enough for passage. The county has said that it is, but there are those who are challenging that interpretation of the law. Um, and then the measure in Sacramento for a budget set aside was defeated, um, but it came in uh, to opposition from the mayor and a variety of interest groups in the city who are planning to put a alternative measure on the ballot in uh, November. But it was not just measures relating to kids that faced challenges in March. It was all measures. Um, this was the single worst cycle in terms of a primary election for tax and bond measures that we have seen in decades. Um, this slide shows you the total number of measures that were on the ballot in March. 
and there were an extraordinary number, uh, 238. And obviously people were hoping to take advantage of what was anticipated to be strong turnout for the Democratic presidential primary, which would bring uh, pro-tax uh, voters to the poll and a lot more Democratic voters to the polls. Only 40% of those measures passed. Now compare that to the passage rate over the course of the last decade, which has been consistently at two thirds or higher. Um, and this was really just a, a staggeringly bad election across the board. And it affected all kinds of measures. Uh, the only measures that really uh, passed with any kind of uh, at a significant rate were uh, city ballot measures for general taxes that required a simple majority vote. Uh, two thirds of them passed, but that's compared to passage rates of uh, you know, between 85 and 100% over the course of the elections dating back to 2010. And all other kinds of measures, especially bond measures that required uh, a higher vote uh, threshold for approval across the state just did terribly. So what happened? Why did we have this negative outcome in an election that we had hoped was going to be one that actually offered a, you know, a good reason for measures to pass? Um, and I, I highlight, and I'm spending some time talking about the March election because I think it's important for us to understand what happened in March that could still affect us in November, and then what factors held us back that might not be replicated in the November election. Um, in addition to sort of doing some analysis of the overall data on the passage and failure of measures, we did some post-election survey work um, to try to understand what was on voters' minds. And basically what that told us was that there was no one factor that seemed to be driving it, but a number of things that came into play. Um, and the first was a sharply negative turn in voters' mood. You remember those right direction, wrong track numbers I led off with. Um, over the course of early 2020, those numbers went into a pretty significant decline ac across most parts of the state, um, driven by increasing concerns about uh, housing, homelessness, and the cost of living more broadly, um, which I think played into voters' consideration of tax measures as well. It was just a, a much more pessimistic sentiment and, uh, and uh, more economic anxiety that were present even pre-pandemic. Uh, the surge in progressive voters, which many of us hoped would uh, arrive with the March primary, didn't show up at all. Um, turnout ended up being only a couple of points higher than it was in 2016, and the hope was that it was going to be dramatically higher. Uh, there's a number of factors that played into that. Obviously, the presidential race, um, which was highly competitive for many months, became dramatically less so in the lead up to California with a number of leading candidates dropping out, almost all of them endorsing Joe Biden. Uh, Bernie Sanders also having a wide lead in California in every poll, which then uh, came through on election day. And so I think voters just felt like their ability to influence what was going to happen was dramatically diminished. Um, in addition, we also had the stock market turbulence. Um, in February, the market was going gangbusters, but the Friday before the election, it plummeted for the first time. And because a lot of voters, Democratic voters, were holding on to their ballots until the last minute, mostly because of the presidential race, they didn't want to vote early and then find out that their candidate had dropped out, they were voting under the shadow of that big economic downturn, which probably played a role. Uh, the virus had some impact. We saw that um, in particular among the same progressive constituencies who support tax measures needed, a disproportionate number of them said they didn't vote uh, because they had concerns about the, the virus even at that point. Um, and for bond measures, we also saw that the impact of recent changes in state law that uh, require uh, more verbiage spent on the fiscal impacts and the ballot language also played a role. Um, and I should note, in some parts of California, there was an active campaign against Proposition 13 at the top of the ballot waged by some anti-tax groups, um, which did reach Republican voters and had an impact among that segment as well, probably not as prevalent in bluer and, and more coastal areas. So what does this all boil down to as we look forward um, as uh, we consider possible measures for November? Well, you know, one of the things that hurt us in March was that lack of voter turnout. And it does not seem likely that we are going to face that in November. Um, when we asked people to rate their interest in the November election on a 10 point scale, 83% rated a 10. This is a question we ask every election cycle and this is about as high a level of engagement as you can possibly imagine. Um, 
In addition, California is going to be uh, sending mail ballots to all voters, which makes it a lot easier for campaigns to monitor who's voted, chase those who haven't, make sure that their voters show up. Um, but you know, we are not going to face the same problem that we faced in March. Uh, this is an electorate that is highly engaged. Um, and in the polling that we have done on revenue measures, we have generally seen some encouraging trends. As I mentioned before, uh, for those measures where we have pre-pandemic and post-pandemic measurements, the numbers have basically held steady. Maybe you know, a couple of points movement, uh, but nothing dramatic. Renewals of existing taxes are also uh, particularly strong. For a lot of our work on kids, obviously, we're trying to establish new sources, so that's, uh, that's a little bit less relevant. Um, we are seeing, however, that, you know, you'll, you'll note early in those slides, the communities that have been most economically impacted by the pandemic, um, especially communities of color, Los Angeles County, lower income households, um, those may be the ones where support is most fluid, where there's more ambivalence about tax measures. Those are traditionally very strong pro-kids constituencies, but we're going to need to carefully monitor sort of how they're weighing the balance of wanting to invest in kids and then what is likely to be continued economic anxiety as we head toward November. We're seeing continued very strong numbers for taxes that are not broad-based. Uh, that could provide funding for kids. Marijuana taxes continue to be overwhelmingly popular with Californians. Um, taxes on more affluent households, real estate taxes on high-end homes, or um, obviously this isn't a local revenue source, but income tax increases on upper-income Californians continue to get uh, very broad support. The more progressive the mechanism, in progressive in the economic sense, the more support it tends to have. Um, all of these trends, again, though, just to note at the bottom of the slide, we have to be mindful or are subject to some change. So what have we learned from recent research that might affect the way we frame ballot measures that involve investing in youth? Well, a lot of the issues and challenges that uh, kids and families face have become exacerbated by the recent crisis. If affordable health housing was a problem before, if funding for healthcare resources for young people was a problem before, if adequate education and early education were problems, uh, park and recreation programs for kids, they are even more of a problem now. Um, with kids not able to attend school, with schools having to, to cut back their budgets, um, and with households having less money to work with and, and a major public health threat present. So there is more urgency and obviously framing messages in ways that realistically affect uh, or realistically reflect the impact of the pandemic without sounding like they're exploitative, but are just honest about the realities of the burdens that it's created um, can be helpful. And particularly as you look at that second bullet, the fact that in many places, the sad reality is what we are going to have to do now is avoid deep cuts uh, rather than expand programs. Um, that, that is a tragic consequence in terms of improving kids' lives, but it, from a political perspective, is an easier argument for us to make. Um, no one wants to go backwards, and voters traditionally are more willing to open their wallets if we're talking about preventing things from getting worse. Uh, we've seen in previous polling that the strong return on investment that we can document for investments in, in early childhood, um, health and, and education, uh, is a reasonably compelling argument for voters. It may become a doubly compelling argument now when we know that we need to give our economy a boost um, and we need to create a long-term foundation for success. Um, that's something I think needs to be tested, but that argument may have higher saliency than what we've seen before. Uh, the role of essential workers is also critically important. Um, whether we're talking about people who are in healthcare, people who are working at grocery stores and public transportation, all of the services that we've needed to keep going, a lot of those workers are people who have young children and who are not in positions where uh, they have easily available childcare, especially during a pandemic. Um, we have seen that on fiscal measures, anything that is framed as supporting essential workers and trying to make their lives easier is really helpful. And obviously it is the kids of many of these essential workers that a lot of the programs we're talking about uh, will really help to benefit. Um, 
there has been some dissatisfaction with distance learning in schools. Uh, we've seen in a number of surveys when we talk to parents, they don't think it's working, they don't think it's productive, they don't necessarily blame school districts because all of this had to be developed on the fly. But what it means is uh, parents are looking for something new. They don't think kids are being well served by the current system and as over the summer, uh, schools and, and cities and, and other agencies that serve youth are going to be thinking about new approaches. Um, that's an opportunity to talk about what additional resources can do to help us get through the challenges we're currently facing. And then finally, um, obviously, uh, there are deep equity concerns that need to be addressed here, both uh, from a public health perspective and an economic perspective. The virus has hit communities of color and low income communities in California disproportionately much harder than others. The public recognizes this, understands it, um, and we've seen some data which says that designing investments that will help to address these equity consequences um, get broad support. Um, and obviously the events of the last week, which we don't have a lot of polling data on yet, um, but certainly on the level of, of uh, criminal justice, uh, they also are highlighting some of the deep inequities uh, that are, are present here in California. Um, so having that equity lens, obviously it's something that I think uh, pretty much everyone on this call already was focused on in terms of public policy and in terms of program design, but in terms of messaging and communications with the public, it may also take um, increased salience now that, that there's a broader public awareness of some of the inequities that are out there. All right, I think I probably went on longer than I was supposed to, uh, Margaret. I will pause there and uh, um, I'm happy to answer any immediate questions if there are any, but otherwise hand it to Nicole for her thoughts and then we can both answer uh, questions. So I have a couple of questions, but I think first we ought to hand it to Nicole and then we can ask you both um, some of the questions that have popped into my mind and that are on the chat. So you have to stop sharing and Nicole can start sharing right great can you guys hear me did that work yes yay <laughs> um awesome well really excited to be with you all today um thank you for all the work that you're doing just you know as dave mentioned i just want to acknowledge the unbelievable challenges we have in the world at the moment and for those of you that are on the front lines like fighting for black lives thank you for your work um, and for black kids um, and all kids of color. I really appreciate the work that all of you do every single day. Um, I think we have a really exciting moment in this country right now. Um, as every day has gone by, I've gotten more and more hopeful um, of what this moment can mean, both the pandemic um, and the lens that it's brought on economic inequality and our healthcare system and all these things, as well as um, racial injustice and the, the lens that we've had on that over the last week. So um, I think even as Dave mentioned, people are concerned about the economy um, and they're worried about the future. They're also open to doing things differently. You know, we've really been um, all experiencing things really differently in the last couple of months. And because of that, I think this is a real opportunity for big change. So just wanted to acknowledge that and thank all of you for the work that you're doing. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about the challenges and opportunities that we have in front of us. So I know most of you on the call have had the chance to meet and work with a lot of you before, um, you know, are considering doing ballot measures moving forward. Um, a few of you considering this November, um, as Dave mentioned, um, we've got some good news there. You should definitely still plan to be moving forward. Um, and we're excited to be, you know, supporting you on that. And for those of you that are looking at ballot measures in 2022 or 2024, um, there's a lot of work that we can do during this time to build for success there. So first thing I wanted to say, oops, oh, sorry this um sorry my bad okay awesome you guys can see see all this right okay um the first thing i wanted to say is that you know even though we're on the defensive in a lot of places meaning a lot of you are going to be fighting for your budgets you're going to be fighting to save after school programs you're going to be fighting to save early childhood programs like you want to be able to make this defense your best offense so what i mean by that is 
as you are talking about the need to preserve these programs, it gives you the opportunity to talk about how important they are. It gives you the opportunity to highlight the stories of the great work that you're doing, what it means for your communities, and to then get it in people's consciousness as you might consider a ballot measure moving forward. So don't think about your budget advocacy work and your potential ballot measure work, if that's something you're thinking about, as separate. They're very much intertwined. And for you to be really successful at the ballot, you're going to have had to build a public consciousness around the need for funding for youth and child programs, regardless of the ballot, right? And so think about how to utilize the defensive work that most of you are gonna be doing around budget cuts at the state level and at the local level to be able to build greater capacity uh, to then uh, be on the offense moving forward. They're not divorced from each other. The next thing is to really play the long game. So not just thinking about, okay, this is the moment that we're in, we need to preserve you know, $2 million of programming, but what is your vision for youth funding in your areas and how can you really be leading with that larger vision, you know, talking to the constituents and to the community members about what you need in order to actually reform the juvenile justice system or what you need in order to actually offer, you know, um, for preschool for everyone in your communities. So think about the future and what the long game is and how do we imagine beyond this budget cycle, beyond, you know, the recession that we're gonna be in in, in terms of this pandemic and think about the long game. So really encourage folks to be coming together, imagining what the future could look like and really playing the long game. The next thing is to expand your coalition. This is a really great opportunity to do that. A lot of folks that have been doing budget advocacy um, most effectively have come together and said, you know, we're gonna do a people's budget, right? Meaning we're gonna look at young people that are being, um, you know, youth organizations that are having their budget cuts, as well as health advocates that are having their budgets cuts, as well as, you know, um, housing advocates that are having their budget cuts, et cetera, and coming together and saying, okay, how can we have a people's budget for the folks that are most vulnerable in our communities, you know, for low income communities, for communities of color, um, immigrant communities, et cetera, and really come together with other organizations and other advocates that are trying to make sure that they're preserving funding. So this is a great opportunity for you to be able to do that, both as you think about potential ballot measures moving forward, you know, how people are a little bit resistant to taxes, but as Dave mentioned, there's still an appetite for taxing the wealthiest among us and for looking at, you know, how can we tax co corporations that are making, you know, so much money, the 1%, how can we tax individuals? How can we tax, you know, things like cannabis, et cetera? There's still an appetite for these things, but you're gonna be most effective if you're coming together with other advocates so that you have a larger plan because you don't wanna be in a situation where you're just fighting each other um, and you're not able to weave a common narrative around what we want for our future and what we want this to look like. Um, the other thing I would say is to think about how you can connect this messaging to this COVID moment. Um, there's been some good stuff that's been written about this. We sort of looked at, you know, how did California respond post um, earthquake in the Bay Area, right, in 1989? And there was a lot of tax measures that were passed that actually said, okay, what can we do to prevent something like this from happening again? So how can you think about like improving health outcomes in communities of color to prevent them from being, you know, um, much more susceptible uh, to things like COVID-19 moving forward, right? How can you think about reforming the juvenile justice system so that we're not in a situation that we are right now, right? Like really utilizing this moment to allow people to think beyond and to think about how we can make these changes moving forward. Um, and I would also say, you know, now that we're in this moment of, um, you know, civil unrest around police brutality and racial injustice, think about that moment as well, right? How can we make sure that we're leveraging this opportunity in these dark times, but to, to make people take, make our legislators take a position on racial justice issues, to make them actually, you know, sort of put their money where their mouth is around investing um, in communities of color. And we need to be assertive in forcing them to do that. Because um, our opponents are assertive in saying, you know, that they need to have their money 
uh, hold their money for all their businesses that are struggling, et cetera. So we've got to be able to do the same. And then finally, I would say we really need to invest in digital organizing. Many of you, you know, are struggling with your budgets right now. It's very understandable, but as part of playing the long game is how can you grow your capacity of supporters? And when we say that, we mean, how do you develop a list of 4,000 people to take action instead of 400 people when you're moving forward? And you can do a lot of that for not a lot of money, right? Saying, you know what, we're gonna do a petition around you know, the need to invest in black communities and the kids, right? Because right now people want to take action. They're, they're, they're taking action at record levels. We've been doing a lot of work around racial justice, the criminal justice reform, and we've never seen this rate of petition signing. Partly people are home and they're on their couches and they've got more time to sign petitions. And partly they're just feeling like they want to do something. Um, and we've got to take advantage of these moments and get folks signing on um, and invest in this digital organizing work now so that we build our list of supporters and we can be more effective moving forward. Um, so those are just a few tips and happy to spend the rest of the time on any questions folks have for Dave and myself. Yeah, if people have other questions, put please put them in the chat. And I don't know, Dave, if you have anything else you'd like to say, having heard that, that we have uh, a question about which we've talked about some about when we started this it was about you know measures during a pandemic now it's about measures during a pandemic and this enormous focus on racial equity and police brutality and i mean you have indicated some ways that you think that that can impact our work and how we organize and how we build coalitions um i you know, there is a possibility that it could have a negative impact. I wonder what you think, Dave, if you have any other thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, I think the short answer is it's too soon to tell. Um, I am hopeful that the debates we're having over the course of the past week will remain a central focus of our conversation as we're heading to November and that there will be sustained and serious attention to um, issues around uh, the criminal justice system and, and the inequities that are inherent in it. Um, as a pollster, given past uh, tragedies that have shown a light on this issue, I am unfortunately pessimistic about the degree to which our political system will continue to hold that uh, issue at the forefront. Um, so I think we just have to wait and see. Um, certainly the economy is, is not going to be dramatically better by November and could be worse. And there are, and the inequities inherent in that, I think are going to continue to get a lot of attention. Um, you know, it is, uh, I, I think both, um, you know, this is one of those occasions where the right thing to do from a moral perspective and from a public policy perspective for kids also lines up with right now, from a political perspective, what is the right thing to do because of voters' attention on this. So, you know, for all those reasons, I think we ought to move forward with an assumption that these are going to continue to be effective ways to make the case um, for investments in kids. But it is, you know, just given the turbulence of the issue environment, it's, it's something we just have to keep a close eye on as the summer and fall continue. And you will come back after you do your more polling about kids specifically. More than happy to and about how this is impacting public opinion about potential ballot measures um, for young people. Um, I have a question here. There are two questions um, that really are for Nicole, um, from one from our friends in San Joaquin County and our friends in Fresno. They want to know more specifically um, how to use digital <laughs> to yeah. get and we are now realizing we have to plan a whole webinar on how to do this. And so we will be doing that. But maybe you can, um, we're being asked for some examples about how to engage support during this time, ads on social media, how people can start doing that now. Totally. I'll talk a little bit about it. And then, yeah, we're, we, we have got an, I've got an amazing um, Vice President of Digital, Salim Zaymed, and our, our team on our firm that will help um, and really get concrete in this in a future webinar, but just a couple of things to start. 
The first thing is you really want to make it as far as volunteer work, right? Having your supporters um, or the folks that you've worked with in coalition before advocates take action. You want to make it as easy for them as possible. Okay. So in order to do that, you want to have very clear ask. You don't want to say, just send a tweet about why supporting kids is important. You want to say, send this exact tweet with this exact hashtag. You can, they could personalize it and maybe write, you know, a, a sentence about their own life and make it personalized, but you want there to be some repetition because in order for things to take traction online, people need to see it again and again and again. So you have to provide that direction and exactly this is the hashtag we want, you know, this is the specific tweet we want you to use, et cetera. The second thing is graphics and images. Photos are really, really important. People pay attention to graphics and they pay attention to photos so much more. We've seen that in the evolution of the online space over the last few years. So you want to provide that. You want to be able to get a compelling photo or a compelling graphic that you can share that's going to allow other people to do it. Those are all things that you can do for free, essentially, aside just the, you know, people power to put those things together, right? Then there's digital advertising. So, you know, if you wanted to spend $500 to do Facebook ads, which you can do on your own, and we, you know, we have supporters to, we have technical assistance to help do that as well, but you could have a petition that says, you know, in this um, age, we want you to take action to support Stockton's kids, you know, and we, you know, we want to do something about supporting Black Lives, like support um, the kids in Stockton, right? So you can have people take action with a petition and Facebook is the easiest way to do that. Um, anyone can do that. We just have to work with you to sort of talk through exactly what that means. And you can, the cool thing about it too, is you can test and you can see, okay, if our goal is to grow our email list, like let's say your email list today has, you know, 1200 people. And before you go to the ballot, you want to get it to a place where it has 12,000 people. You know, some of that you can do organically. That doesn't cost anything. Some of it you can say by getting someone to click on this petition and join our email list, each one of those people are costing us $4. And then you can decide, okay, well, you know, can we spend $2,000, you know, to be able to get 500 new names, et cetera. You don't have to spend the $2,000 and then see, oh no, we only got, you know, 50 names. You can test it at a very small amount of money and then spend more, et cetera. So we'll go into it more in more detail in the next webinar, but those are a couple ideas. Um, Lindy, if you want to unmute yourself and ask for more details, please, please feel free to do that. I know that they're thinking in San Joaquin about jumping in right away, because if you're- yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. We are thinking of jumping in right away. But um, I'm confident that we'll get what we need from that webinar that you have planned. And so I'll link to that and maybe we can just, um, maybe I'll reach out to Nicole and have a, a conversation with her directly. But I think what she's given so far is a good place to start. Um, and we'll give it a shot and see. No Kay, Kay, do you have anything to add? <laughs> I guess not. So. Uh, I don't know if you have any particular comments, Dave, about the potential of a marijuana tax. That was actually very interesting because it was going to go to kids, but also to health. And I think that is particularly appropriate and timely, um, that there would be particular support beyond what they might have seen before with a focus on health. Yeah, that's right. I mean, obviously, um, you know, previously in San Joaquin County, you got didn't hit the two thirds level, but got broad support um, for a measure that uh, the tax marijuana. And I think what Margaret just highlighted is spot on. Um, the, the sort of increased urgency of needing these dollars, the health focus, which obviously is something that the public has been um, zeroed in on given recent events, um, and the fact that this is just going to be a much better electorate, particularly in a more conservative county like San Joaquin, uh, creates more opportunity, I think, to, uh, to, ha to be able to drive those numbers up. Um, so I'm, you know, cautiously optimistic that all of those dynamics are, are ones that ought to be helpful. 
Um, I do want to say that we ha do have uh, another webinar coming up that is actually related to the topics we've been talking about. It is about juvenile justice reform, which we have pointed out um, in this conversation is, is very relevant to this moment in time. I have a slide up about things that are coming up. I don't know if there's anybody else who would like to be unmuted um, or if there are other questions on chat. There's Margaret, I did see one question from Sheldon on the role of one-time federal revenue and, and the impact it might have on ballot measures. Okay. Um, and while we haven't tested that explicitly, I'm not very concerned about that, Sheldon, because number one, in California, the, the sort of cynicism and skepticism about the federal government's role has been so broad. Um, even prior to the crisis, Californians just had a sense that they really couldn't count on the federal government to prioritize California as a place for help, given the you know, well-documented antipathy that this administration has to the state. Um, but I think also, you know, a lot of the stories around federal aid, whether it's PPP or, or various other measures they've taken, have largely focused on the inadequacy of those funds to meet the need. Um, and voters traditionally are way more confident that if they support revenue locally, um, especially if it's ongoing revenue rather than one time, that those dollars are going to get to their communities and help them. Whereas if it comes from the federal government, it's got to filter down through a whole bunch of different systems that may limit its impact. So um, that's another thing that I think we need to keep an eye on. But uh, among the things that are potential obstacles, that, that one is a, a lesser concern, I think, from a public opinion perspective. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to uh, unmute yourself and say something? Um, no, I, was, I just put in there that in St. Louis, in, in particular, my hometown, there's a good push happening. They're making demands of the county um, executive and county council to do both, to immediately fund emergency child care relief with CARES funding, and subsequently then um, put the measure on the ballot in this November, actually. So that's an example of a place that's trying to tie the two together. That's really exciting. And Wendy Lazarus is asking us about schools and communities first. And it was on my list. So um, yeah, I don't know, Wendy, if you want to say, say something about it. But uh, if either Nicole or Dave, Dave have uh, comments about it. Yeah, I mean, I we actually just got hired to help them um, on the digital organizing campaign. So we'll be, we'll be working on that campaign now. So I'll, learn, I'll know a little bit more about it. But from what I understand, um, they haven't seen much of a shift in terms of public support of the measure um, at this point. So um, I think that's a good thing. You know, I think it gives the campaign an opportunity to make the argument that you know, with all of these looming budget cuts, um, we're going to really need to support our schools um, and the community-based programs even more so. Um, and because the target of the tax is pretty limited to corporate commercial property, um, I think it's it's fair that most people will not be impacted by this change um, in a way that they would in, you know, sort of uh, residential property tax, et cetera, during this economic time. So um, I think it, it's looking like it, it, it probably won't hurt it, if anything, could potentially help. But again, a little too early to tell. I don't know, Dave, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think what Nicole said is spot on. Um, the data we've seen, both public and private polling, has generally shown support somewhere in the mid-50s, um, both before and after the pandemic. Um, and obviously there's, you know, there's sort of two competing um, dynamics in play. One is, as Nicole described, the need is so much bigger, and this is a great funding mechanism from the voters' perspective to address it. Um, on the other hand, there's increased economic anxiety, and the Chamber of Commerce is going to spend $100 million telling people that they're going to have to, they as residents will end up having to pay every nickel of this. Um, and so, you know, obviously how that campaign shakes out is going to determine things, but I agree with Nicole. I certainly don't think it's in any worse position now than it was a couple months ago, and it, it may be a little bit better. Uh, but even a couple months ago, it was going to be a challenge, so it's going to be a tough campaign. Totally. But it will be an indication on how it does in everybody's city and county about potential support, because it it may do really well in some places and not as well in others. And sure. there's a lot to learn from, from how it does. Um, I am wondering uh, 
if anybody else would like to make a comment. Jill, you turned off your mic. Do you yeah, want to I'd like to make a comment about schools and communities first. I wanted to know whether Nicole and Dave, you think you have anything to say or any, any uh, reflections on the fact that the governor has declined to endorse the measure. Also, I just do want to say, even though we know that these looming cuts are devastating, uh, I'm interested which is really just a comment about whether people will notice that it's not going to provide any revenue for two years. So selling it as a, oh my God, we have to stop these cuts. I, I, you know, yes, I appreciate your smiling about that. But also if that starts to undercut our, we have to fund these things to keep these devastating cuts from happening. And we sell this as doing that and it doesn't do it until the economy has significantly changed. I'm, I'm fearful that might affect our future efforts. Yeah, I don't really have anything to say about the governor's stuff. I've <laughs> really been engaged in that. Um, but I think in terms of the cuts, you're right, but most voters, you know, won't necessarily, won't see it that way. And they're, you know, they're going to be looking for alternatives and answers. And here is one that is provided, right? So. Yeah, except it won't do it. <laughs> I mean, we're, what I mean is that school districts and communities are going to be having to say, vote for this. It's an emergency. We need it. But we still have to make these big cuts or we're looking for other short-term revenue. It's a really messy message, in my opinion. That's tricky. Well, I know, Margaret, it's, uh, I have to go to something else. I'm sure others do too, but yeah. I know. I was just getting ready to, to say goodbye to everyone. And thank you for participating in this. You will... Um, I have everybody's name on a mailing list now. I will send you a tape if anybody wants to hear it again or share it with other people. We'll send out the slides. Um, and I hope we can continue these kinds of discussions as a community as we figure out these issues and we come back and revisit the new polling. And we, um, I know Michelle sent me an email this morning asking me about what we're doing with our proposed constitutional amendment. We will be uh, continuing to discuss that. And thank you, everyone. I'm going to uh, end the meeting now. Um, this Bye. was great. Bye, everybody. Bye. I'll keep the chat open for a minute so that anybody who wants to ask another question by chat.